Good evening, New Life Baptist Church. Uh, I'm looking forward to being with you guys next week. If you guys can keep that in prayer, I'll, I'll be up there uh, with Isabel. So I'm looking forward to preaching in person to you and also just for the fellowship and catching up also to give you an update as to what has been going on here at Blessed Hope Baptist Church. But you're there in Hosea. Now, Hosea chapter 4, look at verse number 6. Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 6. The Bible begins there by saying, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So the title for the sermon this evening is Destroyed for Lack of Knowledge. Now, I don't want to be destroyed. I don't want New Life Baptist Church to be destroyed. And so in order for us to not be destroyed as a church or as, as people, as families, as individuals, we must have the knowledge of God. We don't want to be people that have a lack of knowledge, right? Because that will lead us to destruction. And we're just continuing on. Remember, Hosea chapters 1, 2, and 3 serve as an introduction to the rest of the book. And as you saw, just a quick uh, reminder, we saw that uh, Hosea's first wife, Goma, represented the physical nation of Israel. And her children, the names that were given to her children, were not my people and, and no mercy. And so, of course, that speaks about uh, the time when uh, God will have a new Israel, not a physical nation of Israel, but a spiritual nation of Israel, which was the wife that Hosea took in chapter number three. Now, we're going back to the physical nation here. We're going back and, and looking at the physical nation and the judgment that God uh, put upon her. And of course, that would be uh, by, the, um, by the Assyrians, the Assyrians that came and they um, you know, took that northern kingdom into captivity, as it were, or dispersed the people out of the land. And then other people were brought into the land and there was a great mix of people. And of course, in the time of Jesus Christ, these people living on this land uh, was known as the Samaritans because Samaria was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, let's start there in verse number one. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. So you can see where it says they hear the word of the Lord, ye children. It's talking about a new prophecy. Hosea is now prophesying to the nation. We've gone away from the introduction. Now Hosea is stepping that up. He's preaching to the people of Israel. It says, For the Lord have a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Now, just a reminder, what was the title for the sermon? It was destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so you can see here that the people of Israel did not have a knowledge of God. Not only did they have no knowledge of God, there was no truth, there was no mercy. Now, brethren, we need mercy. We need God's mercy, but we also need mercy one toward another because we're all sinners, we're all going to make mistakes, and we need to understand, especially as a church, that sometimes your fellow brother or sister in the Lord is going to rub you the wrong way. You know, they're going to let you down. And, you know, you need to just find mercy in your eyes for that person. The same way that God was able to find mercy for you and is able to forgive you for your sins, even though we don't deserve it. Okay? But you can see here that God's people got to a point where there was no mercy. They had no love for the truth and they had no desire to have the knowledge of God. And uh, if you can please keep your finger there and turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. Please go to Nehemiah chapter 8, but keep your finger there in Hosea chapter 4. Because I want to explain to you, obviously the knowledge of God comes from His Word, Right? And if you go to Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 8, Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 8, you know, in order for us to uh, attain uh, knowledge, as it started there in verse number 1, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, right? Hear the word of the Lord. This is why it's so important for you to be in church. For you, get, for you to get behind um, you know, a preacher, listen to the preacher. And this is why it's important for the preacher that gets behind the pulpit to feed people the Word of God because we want to get knowledge. We want to get truth. We want to find mercy, right? And in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 8, I just want you to focus on these words. It says here, So they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense and cause them to understand the reading. Why is it that we need to be in church? What is it that the preacher needs to be mindful as they preach to God's people? We want to read the book of God. We want to read His scriptures. We want to read His law. But look, it says here, they read the book 
So we read in the book of the law of God distinctly. So if something is distinct, it's very clear. You know, it is the job of the preacher to make sure that God's word is clear to the hearer. This is how we gain knowledge of God. But then it says this, and gave the sense. What does that mean? That means not only is the preacher to read God's word clearly, make it clear, but give it meaning, you know, give it its sense, help people understand what is being preached, what is being understood from the word of God. And then it says, and cause them to understand, right? So I don't get behind the pulpit, uh, brethren, to, you know, just to speak. You know, I'm quite an introverted person naturally, you know. I'm not really someone that loves to speak a lot. But, you know, when I get behind the pulpit, I understand that it's my job to cause you to understand. Uh, look, understand the reading, okay. You know, I don't get behind the pulpit just so you can understand my thoughts my opinions, my logic, my wisdom. No, it's to cause you to understand the reading, the reading of God's word. And if your preacher is helping you understand God's word, brethren, your job is to hear, your job is to listen. Hosea was being sent to this northern kingdom of Israel for them to listen. He says, look, hear me. But of course, these people were so stubborn. These people had rejected God and, you know, they couldn't hear clearly God's message. But it is our job as preachers to make sure you understand the reading, the Bible. So when you leave church, you know, you leave having, you know, being able to say, well, I gained some knowledge. I understand God's word deeper. Oh, that, that Bible verse makes more sense to me now. I see how you need to, uh, I understand the meaning of that passage. Whereas before, maybe I didn't have that understanding, right? So this is important, brethren. Hosea is coming to preach a message and he's telling them, here, pay attention. And brethren, when you're in church, listen, pay attention to God's word. I want you to understand the reading. Tonight, I want you to understand Hosea chapter 4. Let's go back to Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 2. So instead of hearing God's word, how is this northern kingdom behaving? It says, by swearing and lying and killing so they're murderers and stealing thefts and committing adultery they're cheating on their spouses they break out and blood toucheth blood so we have a list of sins that the people in this land were committing at this point in time you know i'm not 100 percent sure what um, and blood touch of blood means but let me just give you uh, my opinion on that one where you know you can see here that killing or murder is one thing that's going on in the land. I mean, this place had gone become so wicked. And so obviously when you, when you commit murder or you kill someone, you're shedding blood, right? But what we have here is blood touching blood, blood touch of blood. So what I gather from this is instead of it just being people committing murder on the land, that there are serial killers on the loose. All right. I mean, it's, it's just it's one death after another death. It's one murder after another murder. Right. I mean, there are these serial killers. You know, there are serial uh, there is serial adultery taking place. There is serial uh, stealing thefts going on. I mean, this place, the society in Israel had waxed worse and worse. I mean, sometimes I don't, I don't think we fully appreciate necessarily how wicked these uh, nations became because they're meant to be the people of God. They're meant to be uh, a nation that reads God's word and has a fear of God, but they get to themselves in a place where they're just so bad, you know. And, and you know, I think about Australia, and obviously we live in a wicked nation. This world, you know, this this nation's getting worse and worse. But sometimes I just read these passages and I think, wow, how bad can a nation get? It seems like Australia isn't even uh, near as bad as sometimes what we read about in the Bible. But then again, uh, you know, we are definitely on a downward trajectory, right, as a nation. We are getting worse and worse. Our nation is turning our backs against the Lord. And so we see the same thing playing out in the northern kingdom of Israel. Let's go back there in verse number three. It says, therefore, so therefore, because of all these sins, because of all these wicked behaviors, it says, therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. What do we learn there? We learn that a nation that is in sin, a nation that is so wicked, 
actually has ramifications on God's creation. It has ramifications on the land. The land will mourn, right? The, the, the fowls are going to be affected. The birds are going to be affected. The, the animals are going to be affected. The fish in the sea are going to be affected. And, uh, you know, one, one strange truth of the Bible is this direct correlation between man's sin and the effect that it has upon this world. Of course, when God created Adam and Eve, He gave Adam and Eve dominion over the earth. Okay, and so we are to rule. Hey, we are the apex predator. You know, we, we, are, we are the chief on this earth, right? That's an authority that God gave us. But also when we commit wickedness and sin, it has a direct influence, effect on God's creation. Now, if you can please turn, keep your finger there, and let's turn to Romans chapter 8. I just want to show you this. Romans, you go to Romans chapter 8. And I mentioned Adam and Eve to you. And of course, when Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord, you know, God uh, judged Adam and Eve and the, and the serpent. But the judgment that he put upon Adam, you go to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read to you from Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, it says, And unto, unto Adam he said, so this is the words of God to Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, God says these words, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So God is telling Adam, because you've sinned, the ground is going to be cursed. And of course, that's we get the thorns and the thistles that come up. And so we, we learn that there is a curse on this earth because of man's sin. There is a direct consequence or direct correlation, maybe there's better the word. Uh, when, when man is in wickedness and in sin, this earth, this creation, is, perishes. You know, th this creation suffers when mankind sin against the Lord. Now you're there in Romans chapter 8, verse number 22. Go to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 22 for me. And I'll just show you this in another passage here. It says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Did you know God's creation is in pain? It, it's travailing because it, there's a curse. There's a curse on this creation. There's a curse on this earth because of man's sin, okay? And you know, all of creation wants to be delivered from this curse. Let's keep going there, verse number 23. And not only they, so not only the creation, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, or that's to witness, the redemption of our body. So even this creation, even this flesh is groaning. Even this flesh is travailing. Even this flesh wants to be redeemed. Okay, And of course that comes with the resurrection. That comes at the rapture when we put off this wicked flesh that we have and God gives us a new resurrected you know, body. Not only are we saved in the spirit, not only is our spirit and soul saved, but there's coming a day when our body will be saved at the resurrection. Hey, we no longer will have to deal with, with sin, okay? And this will be a blessing to God's creation, okay? This will be ultimately, I should say, a blessing to God's creation. If you can, please turn to Revelation 22. Let's go to Revelation 22 if you can. And at what point does the earth have this curse re uh, released from itself? Well, it, it comes when God creates the new heaven and the new earth. So just like we have these fleshly bodies and it'll be changed into new, perfect, immortal, sinless bodies, well, our earth will also experience a change, a new heaven, a new earth, okay? And that curse will be gone. In Revelation 22 verse 3, speaking about God having created a new heaven and a new earth, it says in verse number 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. What a beautiful thing. So we're going to be delivered from it. Well, we're actually already delivered from the curse. Christ became the curse for us. That's why we're saved. But once again, we're stuck in these bodies, in this sinful nature that we have. Hey, but one day that will be released from that curse, as it were, and receive those redempted bodies. But one day, all of God's creation will also be redeemed from the curse. 
when God creates the new heaven and the new earth. Okay? So we learn that, you know, our sin, our wickedness has ramifications on God's creation. And I, sometimes I don't think we even think about that all that much, but that is certainly the case. Okay? Now let's go back to Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 3. Hosea chapter 4, verse number 3. It says, Yet let no man strive nor reprove another. So, of course, this has to deal with chapter, sorry, verse number 2, with how they're you know, committing thefts and, and lying and, and murders, all those kinds of things. So it says, Look, stop doing that. But then it says this, For thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Now, you know, there's a, a definite breakdown in society here with the northern kingdom. And when it talks about the priest here, you know, even though in the New Testament we've all been made kings and priests, right? But when we're talking about the priest here, of course, it's in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. And the priest held an office, right? He held an office to minister in the house of God. And of course, the New Testament house of God is your local church. And so what we're dealing with here, when it talks about the priest, it's not just dealing with everybody in general, but it's dealing with those that are in you know, ordained positions in the house of God. So if you wanted to take this and, and apply it to a New Testament principle, this would be as though there, was, there were people you know, striving or fighting with the church pastor or the church deacons, right? You know, if you're fighting with someone that holds an office in, in the church, this would be equivalent to that, as it were, right? Now, the idea here is not only are they doing wickedly toward their fellow man, but the priest is supposed to be a, a person that loves the Lord. He's supposed to be a person that is serving the Lord and serving the people of God. You know, he's just, you know, trying to teach them God's ways. The priest is supposed to be doing that, right? Uh, they're there to the, offer the sacrifices so the Lord will be pleased uh, when he smells that sweet smelling savor of the sacrifice. And, you know, the people of the land were also fighting or striving with the priests, right? And again, you can take the principle here in the New Testament that, you know, if you're someone that hates your pastor, you know, I'm your pastor, right? If you come and you, you hate me, you make my life difficult, you know, everything that I try to do, you try to fight against, you know, I'm trying to lead people a certain way and you, you know, you're going around backstabbing me, you're going around going, you know, saying bad things about, you know, whether it's me as the pastor, one day we have deacons, you know, other people that are in ordained positions, you're going around causing strife, you're like the people that are mentioned in verse number two that are going about killing, lying, committing adulteries, you know, it, it, you know it, it's, and those are extremely wicked things. Well, striving against God's man in the house of God is equally as wicked. And so you need to be mindful of this. Please take your Bibles and go to Proverbs chapter 6. Go to Proverbs chapter 6 for me and verse number 16. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 16. The Bible reads, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Look, it says, A proud look, a lying tongue. And so the lion, lion was mentioned there in Hosea, right? Lion tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. We saw, we saw the killings that were taking place in Hosea. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. You know what God hates? God hates somebody that sows discord amongst the brethren. You know, you come into church and you create divisions. You come to church and you create problems in church, right? And listen, when you're making problems, even within the church, you're also creating problems for the pastor. You're creating problems for God's minister. So please be careful with how you treat God's house. You know, please be careful about, you know, the problems you create in church. You know, if you're going about and speaking bad of people, you're going about, you know, sharing gossip and news, you know, you're causing strife for God's minister, you know, because eventually that, it's, it's God's minister, it's, it's the man of God, the priest here in the Old Testament that has to clean up the mess. Hey, this is something God hates. And, you know, God wants our church to be of one accord, you know, of one mind, have the mind of Jesus Christ, for there to be love in the house of God, for us to esteem each other better than ourselves. 
you know so uh, please you know don't make church a place where you feel you can come and gossip and, and tell everybody you know uh, problems about this brother in the Lord or this sister in the Lord that is a wrong place in fact that is there is no place to do such thing if you have a problem with a brother in the Lord or a sister in the Lord you need to go and sort that out with them one on one you know not bring it to the house of God and cause mischief cause strife okay and look you know I'm the pastor I'm the one that makes decisions for our church right and look I know that I'm gonna make decisions that you're not always going to agree with you know you can't please everybody that's the role of a leader you just have to learn that you're not gonna please everybody so you you know just make the best decision that you believe you can make and look if I make decisions that you disagree with hey you know don't cause me strife just get behind me support what I'm trying to do you know pray for me if you think I'm in in that much of a wrong but the worst thing you can do is cause problems and strife you know if you can't get under my leadership then I highly recommend find a church find a pastor that you can get under okay because I don't want you to be somebody that God hates because of your actions all right but what we see here when it comes to the northern kingdom in Israel they had become such you know where God hates the fact that they're causing strife to the house of God and God's priest now let's go there back to Hosea chapter 4 verse number 5 it reads therefore shalt thou fall in the day and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night and i will destroy thy mother so when talk about here destroy thy mother again picture the northern kingdom of israel you know as this uh, uh, you know adulterous woman and of course gomer was kind of that picture in that sense right again her children uh lo ruhama and lo am i you know, Lo Ruhama was um, no mercy, and, and, uh, and then we had, the, uh, you know, not my people. And so, you know, that physical nation had rejected God. You know, that, that physical nation was acting like an a, a adulterous woman, and therefore God says, look, I'm going to destroy your mother. Okay, we're going to, again, destroy that northern kingdom. All right? But when it mentions there in verse number 5, and thou shalt fall in the day, the idea that I get here is that their de demise as a nation will be very public you know it'll be there'll be all to see you know when the Assyrians come and and take them away you know the other nations are going to be here about it. it's not going to be this thing that gets swept under the rug in fact it is it is so public it's recorded for us in God's Word and we've had you know basically it's recorded for all eternity how how Israel had become this wicked nation that had fallen but then it says and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night so the night he represents darkness you know uh these prophets the preachers these these false prophets i should say are blind you know are, are the, the blind leading the blind you know they don't know god's judgment they don't know what god is saying and so they're in in the night as it were but they will also fall you know not only will the nation fall but these false prophets will fall all together in god's judgment they will be destroyed by the assyrians and verse number six my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge now i don't want us to be as i mentioned i don't want us to be a people that lack knowledge right what does it mean to lack knowledge here it says because thou hast rejected knowledge now, that's pretty bad right when, when god has his wisdom he's got his knowledge he wants to give it to us and we say god i don't want your knowledge i think i know better than you you know i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna walk in my ways i'm gonna live how i want to live uh, I, I don't want your knowledge god right i mean that's pretty wicked to take that approach but look at this because thou hast rejected uh, knowledge he says i will also reject thee man i don't want to be rejected by god right i mean but here's the thing the, the way you get rejected by god is to first reject his knowledge okay now what does that mean it says here that thou shalt be no priest to me seen thou hast forgotten the law of thy god i will also forget thy children so what does it mean to reject god's knowledge well it told us that in verse number six seen thou hast forgotten the law of thy god you see brethren if you forget god's laws if you forget picking up the bible and reading it and learning it you are acting at like one who is rejecting god's knowledge okay so again i don't want to be that church i don't want to be that person i don't want you to be those people and brethren let me encourage you once again over and over again pick up your bibles every day 
read it. First thing you do when you wake up in the morning, open God's Word and read it. Okay, read it. I don't want you to be someone that goes day after day, week after, day, after week, not picking up their Bibles, maybe only taking your Bibles to church, and that's the only place you get it. Well, brethren, if you forget God's laws, okay, you are rejecting God's knowledge. What is that saying? The only way you can truly get knowledge is by reading God's law. You know, these things are together. You, you, are, you are not knowledgeable if you reject God's law. You become foolish, all right? Now, when we talk about being rejected, you know, that there are three ways to look at this. And obviously, uh, probably the most common way that we talk about it is talking about a reprobate. You know, a reprobate, that would be an unbeliever who has rejected God time and time and time again, and God has rejected them. But first of all, I just want you to notice that this nation were God's people. He refers to them as his people, right? And so, you know, rejecting God's knowledge, what do we learn there? It leads to personal destruction, number one, right? Number two, you receive heavy chastisement, right? Because God, again, was going to allow the Assyrians to come and take them into captivity. Now, I'm going to read to you from 1 Samuel chapter 15. And can you please go to Romans chapter 1 for me? You go to Romans chapter 1. I'll turn to 1 Samuel 15 verse 26. Because I want to show you how even a believer can become rejected by God. Okay? A believer can become rejected by God. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 26, it reads, And Samuel said unto Saul, that's King Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. All right. So what do we learn there? That God rejects those that have rejected him. Saul, King Saul, had rejected God's word, so God says, I'm going to reject Saul. Now, this is obviously not the same as an unbelieving reprobate, okay? But when Saul is rejected, it means that he's going to lose his authority as king over Israel. Now, brethren, you as a believer, God has made us kings and priests. God wants to give us rewards in heaven. He wants us to lay up our treasures in heaven, right? He wants to use us. He wants us to serve Him, you know, all the days of our life. Whatever is left in our life, God wants to use us. And when we get to heaven, He's going to reward us for the great works we've done for Him. But you know what, brethren? If you reject God's law, you can be saved on your way to heaven. Nothing changes that. Once saved, always saved. But if you reject God's word, you reject His knowledge, you reject church, you reject reading the Bible, and you say, you know what, I don't want God, God's knowledge, I'm smart enough, I can do things my own way, well, don't be surprised when God rejects you, okay? And what I mean by that is there are certain things, certain things that God wanted you to, to bless you with, certain rewards that He wanted to give you in heaven that you're not going to have, okay? Just like King Saul, he wasn't damned to hell, okay? But he lost his authority. He lost his office as the king of Israel. And eventually, he lost his life. That's how eventually he lost his authority. And so God may very well remove you from this world earlier than planned, you know, earlier than he desired because you've turned against him. You know, God may very well remove all the blessings he's given you. You know, the rewards that he had planned to give you to heaven, you're going to go to heaven and, and lose your reward because you did not attain that which God wanted to give you. And so, yes, even God's people can get to a point where they are rejected by God. But when I, when I mention that, of course, I'm not talking about salvation, but the rewards that you would have, the blessings that you would have, um, you know, otherwise, if you had walked in the ways of God. The second way that you can think of a reprobate, because, of course, the nation of Israel here, you know, when you, when you think about these nations, you always have to remember that they, they, are, they have a mix of people that are saved and unsaved. Right? I mean, this could be the case of a church. You know, I'm sure there are many good churches where there are a lot of saved people, but there are a lot of unsaved as well. Sometimes that happens, you know. And um, so when we talk about an unbeliever, an unbeliever can also become rejected by God, but this is a really dangerous place to be, okay? Because they're in Romans chapter 1, verse number 28. Look at this Romans chapter 1, verse number 28. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Hey, they don't want the knowledge of God. They don't even want to retain God. They don't want to think about it. This is talking about an unbeliever here. It says, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And so God can give an unbeliever over to a reprobate mind. 
Okay. Now look at verse, look at how verse number twenty-eight begins again. It says, "And even as they did not like to retain God." So even as they don't want God, they don't want to think about God, they don't want the knowledge of God, they reject God. Well, God has rejected them by giving them a rejected mind and then they go about doing extremely wicked, filthy acts. Okay, That person, you know, I haven't got time to go through this in depth, but that person has been rejected by God as an unbeliever. Hey, that person will never be able to believe the gospel. They will never be able to turn to God for salvation and they are damned. They are damned even before they go to hell. They've lost their opportunity to be saved because they will not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've seen how a believer can be rejected. We've seen how an unbeliever can become reprobate, rejected. But you know what? What we're learning here, we're looking at an entire nation. The entire nation of Israel was rejected. So not only can a believer, an unbeliever, but also an entire nation can become rejected in the eyes of God. And this is what's happening now to the northern kingdom of Israel. They had become rejected by God. And, uh, you know, this generation will, will suffer. And, and as I've, I've covered before, as I taught before, this northern kingdom never recovered. They never came back into the land. They became dispersed. They became mixed with the Samaritans. You know, they became the Samaritans because they were mixed with all kinds of people. And so they never recovered their former glories and their former kingdoms. They've been completely rejected. All right? Now, let's keep going. Hosea chapter 4, verse number 7. Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 7. It says, As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. So when it says that as they were increased, it's speaking about the fact that they had children, right? Uh, so it's saying basically as, as the nations grew and had generation after generation, children and grandchildren, that they also, they, their, their sin also increased against the Lord. So the, the, what we learn here is that the parents were not teaching their children God's ways. All right? The parents were a, a negative influence on their children's life. The parents were teaching them ungodly practices and not teaching them the ways of God. And you know, whenever I think about these, I get very sad because, you know, I'm a father. I love my kids. I've got many kids and... You know, I know parents love their children. I know parents generally want the best for their children. And you know, parents, you know, if you love the Lord and you want the best for your kids, and if you love your kids, you have to teach them the ways of the Lord. You have to teach them, okay? Don't think that just taking your children to church is enough. You need to talk to them about God. You need to tell them what is right and wrong, okay? You need to understand that our children are growing up in a wicked society, where, where they're getting confusing messages. Hey, we need to step in and teach our children to know what is right and wrong, to know what pleases the Lord. Because it's very easy for our children's hearts to be turned. Again, they've got this sinful flesh, right? Uh, there's that part of them that if, you know, that they're going to be struggling with, uh, you know, the flesh versus the spirit, the new man versus the old man, they're going to have that constant battle that you and I have. And the only way they can have victory in that battle is if you teach them, if you guide them in the ways of the Lord, right? And of course, step number one is to get them saved, right? Step number two is to teach them what is important, what holds eternal value, right? And, and for them to just love the Lord, you know? I don't want to see my children being destroyed with the coming generation, uh, you know? I don't know how long God's going to hold back His ultimate wrath. You know, we know that at the end of the world, God will pour out His wrath, not just on Australia, not just on one nation, not just on Israel, but on the entire world, you know. So we need to get prepared and understand that our nation, our world is getting worse and worse. And so much then is required for us to teach our children what is right. Verse number eight. They, and I'll tell you who they, they are at the moment, in, in a moment. They eat up the sin of my people and they set their hearts on their iniquity. So you can see here that God's people are committing sin and iniquity. Okay, but who are the they? Well, verse number nine explains it for us. And there shall be like people, like priests. So the they that eat up the sin of my people are the priests. Let me explain that to you soon. And then it says, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them their doings. So it's saying here that the priest, even though the priest is meant to be, you know, someone serving God, that the priests are going to become like the people on the land. 
The people in the land are committing sin, they're committing iniquities, well, the priests will be just like them. And in verse number 8, it says that the priests will eat up the sin of my people, right? And they set their heart on their iniquity. So the priests, God's, God's you know, ministers in the temple, in the house of God, are looking at the sins of the nation and they're going, man, I wish I, I, want, to, I want to be sinful like that. You know, I want to do the same things that they're doing. They're going about committing adultery. The priests are like, man, you know, if, if my nation's doing it, why can't I do it? You know, are they getting drunk? Well, I want to get drunk, right? And so what you're seeing here is that the priests are just looking on the sins of the nation and they themselves are starting to compromise on God's laws. Now, you know, this is important to think about because it is not right for sins to, uh, sorry, for priests to meditate and, and to think about the sins of their people. Now, the Roman Catholic Church messed this up, don't they? They have their so-called priests and they have their confessional booths where people come and they confess their sins. I mean, think about being a man, think about just being a man in this position where you're having, you know, a, a church with a lot of Catholics coming day after day, day after day, confessing their sins to you. I mean, think about all the potential sins that they may be saying that the so-called priest is hearing in his ears. Don't you think that's going to have a negative effect on him? You know, it is not, it is not, you know, a man is not made to carry and to think and meditate and eat up the sins of other people. You know, as your pastor, I have my own sins. I have my own iniquities and I have the, my own challenges and I've got, you know, the sins of my family and, and their problems and their hardships they go through. That's enough. Like, you know, having to deal with, with my own issues and my own family's issues, that's enough. You know, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a man, uh, you know, God has not set me up to be a man that you come and, and tell me about all your sins. And tell me all about your, your wicked uh, iniquities and, and all the things that you, you go through and you have to confess those things to me. Brethren, man was not created to be like this. The only person that you should be confessing your sins to is the Lord God. You know, the only man that could carry our sins was Jesus Christ. Okay, a man cannot carry another man's sins. All right, so what is the point of this? You know what, even though I'm your pastor, I am not the person you come to tell me about all your wicked filth, you know, all your iniquities, all your sinful habits. I don't want to hear it. Number one, I want to think the best of you. All right? You know, I don't want to be thinking about you in, in an awful way. You know, you commit sins, I commit sins. I don't need to hear it all. I, I, don't, I don't want to hear it at all, to be honest with you. But the problem is when a, a person in authority, like in God's house, does set himself up to be a man that just listens to sins, listens to all the problems. You know, the flesh, this, this flesh enjoys sin. This flesh enjoys the pleasures of sin, even though it's only for a season. So when you're, when you're just hearing sin after sin and, and all the filthy things that, that people do, well, then it will be natural for a man that has a sinful nature to think, well, you know what, if the, pe if, if the people are our nation, if the people in my church are uh, getting themselves in these wicked things, then why should I, you know, maybe I should be doing, why should I be the one living a clean life? You know, you know and it just feeds the flesh. It is, there is no use, you know, to hear those problems that you have, brethren. You have sins, you go and you confess them to God. I cannot forgive your sins. The Roman Catholic priest cannot, confess, can, cannot forgive your sins. The only one that can forgive your sins is the Lord God. He's the only one that can bear it. Okay? So, don't get into this thought that, well, my pastor or someone else in the church is the person that I need to go to to tell them about all my problems and all my sins. That's not the right place. Okay? You're just going to feed the flesh of other people and you can cause them to stumble, cause them to get themselves into the same kinds of sins. So, you can see here that the priests became like the people. That the priests started doing the same wicked sins that the people in his nation were doing. Verse number 10. It says, For they shall eat, again, talking about the priest here, and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom, that's the priests, and shall not increase, because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. So when you're, when you're, when you're um, indulging yourself in the sins of others, it's going to cause you to walk away from the Lord and commit your own sins. You know, again, look at verse number 10 again, beginning, it says, For they shall eat, that's eat of the sins, 
and not have enough. Brethren, this is a warning from God's word that sometimes you think if you just commit some sin, it's going to satisfy you. You know, you can be tempted, man, if I do this sin, I'm going to get my way. I'm going to get something I really want. Okay? But the Bible's telling us here, it will not be enough. You're not going to be satisfied. Sin will never give you satisfaction. Okay? No long-term satisfaction anyway. Okay? And you're going to desire it again and again. It is better to stay away, especially from sins that are addictive. You know, uh, you know alcoholism. You know, stay away from that. When you get addicted to some type of sin, you know, you, know, you, you, can, you will go you know, for beer after beer, you know, alcohol after alcohol, and it's not going to satisfy your flesh. You're going to want more and more, and then you find yourself in a really bad place. I mean, especially addictive things, brethren, stay away from those things. You know, there's a saying uh, that's quite popular that says, sin will take you farther than you want to go keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. I mean, that is a true saying. I've heard so many preachers quote that one. Uh, it is so true. You know, you think if I just do this one little sin, but before you know it, it's taking you further than you wanted to. You know, it's cost you more than you were willing to pay. Sin never satisfies. Okay, it just takes you down this downward spiral. Verse number 11, it says, Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. I mentioned the alcohol because the wine is mentioned here. But whoredoms, you know, thinking that, you know, if I, if I just look at the opposite sex, you know, men, you know, if I, 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 you know, there's nothing wrong with me just looking at that woman that's not my wife and lusting after her. You know, before you know it, it's going to take you further than you intended. You know, you're going to be potentially committing, you know, whoredoms, can, can, you know, committing adultery or you know, any kind of crazy sins if you start allowing yourself to give in to these sinful uh, desires, right? And so verse number 11 is quite interesting. It mentions whoredom, and then it says, and wine and new wine take away the heart. Now, what I thought was interesting about this passage is that the, it differentiates between wine and new wine. And so, you know, those that make the argument that every time God mentions wine in the Bible, it's alcoholic, well, in this verse, it cannot be because you've got wine. And look, yes, wine can sometimes refer to alcohol. In this case, it is alcohol. But you can also see that there is something called new wine. And sometimes the Bible just refers to it as wine. And that is freshly squeezed grape juice before it's become alcoholic. It's new. It's new wine. It hasn't had time to sit there and uh, ferment and become alcoholic. All right. So it's telling us that whoredoms will take us away from the Lord. Okay, we can see that wine, alcoholism, drunkenness will take you away from the Lord, but also new wine. And you say, well, what, what does that mean? Does that mean grape juice is sinful? Grape juice can take us away from the Lord. Well, let's understand this a little bit. If you can please um, keep your finger there. Let's go to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28 and verse number 7. Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was preaching to the southern kingdom and if I remember correctly, I think Isaiah lived about the same time as Hosea anyway. But Isaiah was preaching to the southern kingdom, right? As Hosea was, Hosea was preaching to the northern kingdom of Israel. But Isaiah 28, verse number 7, it says, But they also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. Look, the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. So you can see here that the, the priests had become alcoholics. They started drinking the wine, started drinking the strong drinks. And it says here that because they've done that, they err. They, they make errors in vision. They can't preach properly. They make mistakes all the time. Okay? They're preaching false things. They stumble in judgment. They can't differentiate between what is right and wrong when they're under the influence of alcohol. So you can see that, you know, you know I'm pretty sure Isaiah and Hosea lived around the same time. They're both mentioning the same thing, that the priests of God had become alcoholics, right? They'd seen the people of the land become alcoholics, and they're like, well, you know, why not me? Why can't I just enjoy, you know, a, a wine from time to time? You know, God's ministers in the house of God are, are commanded to stay away from those substances. Those substances 
uh, are wicked, they're sinful, they can cause you to get into severe uh, wicked behavior. I'm going to read to you from Leviticus chapter 10, verse number 8. Leviticus chapter 10, verse number 8. It says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink. Of course, Aaron was the first high priest. And his family would be the priestly line that would serve in the temple of God. God is telling Aaron, hey, don't drink alcohol. Okay? It says, uh, do not drink wine nor strong drink thou, nor thy sons with thee. When ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. God is saying, look, I'm going to kill you. You know, if you get drunk, you know, if you start drinking alcohol, God says, I'm going to kill you. Why? It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that ye may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. He says, look, Aaron, you need to teach God's word. You need to differentiate between what is clean and unclean, what is holy and unholy. You need to pass judgment. You need to teach people God's word and therefore stay away from such substances like wine and alcohol. Okay, but you can see here in the time of Hosea and Isaiah, the priests had become drunk. Okay, they had no reverence for God's word or God's ways. You know, it was the place, it was a shambles. You know, it was a disaster. Now, anyway, I wanted to show you, because uh, you're there in Isaiah, aren't you? Please go to Isaiah 65. Go to Isaiah 65. I just want to show you how new wine refers to non alcoholic juice. Okay, non alcoholic juice. Isaiah 65 and verse number 8. Isaiah 65 and verse number 8. It says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. I won't keep reading, but it says, As the new wine is found in the cluster. What's the cluster? What's the cluster of grapes that's on the grapevine? Right? Before those grapes, while, sorry, while those grapes are on the cluster, before they're taken and, and, uh, and juiced, all right? The Bible says there's new wine in the grape, in the cluster. So, of course, that is wine or, or juice, grape juice, a grape product that has not become alcoholic. So, new wine refers to non-alcoholic wine. Now, you're still wondering, you're probably still scratching your heads, well, why is new wine mentioned with whoredoms and wine, which is alcohol? Well, if you can, please go to Joel chapter 1. I just want to show you that. Joel chapter 1, verse number 4. I want to show you why... An alcoholic who drinks alcoholic wine would desire new wine, okay? And what the problem is with an alcoholic desiring new wine. So my point is, there's nothing wrong with new wine in of itself, because it's just non-alcoholic, freshly squeezed grape juice, but it is a problem for the alcoholic, okay? So go to Joel chapter 1 and verse number 4. Joel chapter 1 and verse number 4. It says, <clears throat> that which the... Uh, Palo, sorry, I'll read that again. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. So we're looking at all these little critters that eat uh, fruits and, and leaves and trees, right? And so we start with this worm, and then it goes, look, whatever he leaves, the locusts are going to eat, okay? And then it says, and that which the locusts have left, hath the canker worm eaten. So whatever the locust leaves, there's going to be this canker worm that eats up the rest of it. And that which the canker worm have left, have the caterpillar eaten. So once the canker worm is filled, the caterpillar is going to come and eat up the rest of it. What this is speaking about is that God's going to send these creatures to basically um, uh, be, be like a plague in the land, as it were. Right? They're going to eat up the crops. They're going to eat up you know, uh, the, the grapevine. Because then it says in verse number 5, it says, awake ye drunkards. So who is God speaking to here? The drunks. Those that are alcoholics, right? They're addicted to alcohol. Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl all ye drinkers of wine. So that's the alcohol. Look at this. Because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. God is saying, look, start crying ye drunkards because you're not going to get any more new wine. Okay. So new wine, once again, is freshly squeezed grape juice. Why is that going to be cut off from the drunkard? Because all these critters had come and destroyed the crops. Okay? All the grapes had been eaten up by these animals. And so the, what the new wine represents, when we go back to Hosea, is not that 
nat, uh, freshly squeezed, squeezed uh, non-alcoholic grape juice is sinful, but the reason the drunkard wants the new wine is because they want to turn the new wine into alcohol. Okay? And because they don't have any new wine, they're going to howl and weep and mourn because they're so addicted to the substance. So when we look at you know, new wine in the eyes of an alcoholic, it's the addiction. The addiction, hey, this alcohol is not enough to satisfy me. I'm getting drunk. But then, hey, once I've finished up all this alcohol, I'm going to go after the new wine, which I'm going to turn into alcoholic beverage and, and drink that up, right? And so the new wine represents the addiction, the fact that they have to go uh, and seek after wine time and time and time and time again because of their addiction. All right, let's go back to Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 12. Actually, let me just summarize verse number 11. So God's warning them of whoredoms. He says, look, your whoredoms have taken you away from me. Uh, your, your alcoholism has taken you away from me. And even your addiction for more and more alcohol. You know, these are dangerous things. These are things that the people on the land have done. Now, let's go to verse number 12. Actually, verse number 11 doesn't sound a lot. Sounds a lot like Australia, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, drunkards and, and whoredoms. I mean, yeah, you know. We live in a wicked world. That's all I can say. Verse number 12. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms have caused them to err, and they have gone a whoring from under their God. Just very quickly, God's people, instead of asking counsel from God, they've gone to their stocks. They've gone to their, their idols. Their, their, their idols of wood is what God is saying, right? That they're not getting clear answers from God. They feel they've rejected God's knowledge. So they've gone after idol worship. Verse number 13. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains. So these are the, sac these are the, uh, the worship, the sacrifice. They do not to God, but to the false idols. Okay? Uh, tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills and the oaks and poplars and elms. Because the shadow thereof is good. So they go in under these trees and they send up images because the shade. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom and your spouses shall commit adultery. Now, the Bible differentiates here between whoredoms and adultery. It says, look, your daughters, those that are unmarried, when they commit you know, sexual perversions, that's called whoredoms. But when your wife commits sexual perversion, she's committed adultery, when she cheats on the spouse. And so, look, these marriages were falling apart on the land. Verse number 14. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. For themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore the people that doth not understand shall fall. Now what I believe this is teaching us, because one thing that I was struggling with here is why would God not punish this wickedness? Well, if you remember when we read Romans chapter 1, verse number 28, I'll just read it again. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You know, sometimes you get to a point with God where God says, you know what, if you just want to be wicked like that, I'm just going to give you over, I'm going to give up on you. You can go and do those things if you will. Okay? Now, brethren, when we understand God's punishment, especially as His people, as His believers, God's punishment is good. It's for, a, for our profit. Please go to Hebrews chapter 12. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. The fact that God says, I'm not going to punish you anymore, that's a pretty bad state. That, mean God, that means God has rejected them. Okay, God has rejected them. You know, it is good to be punished by God. You know, when we do wicked things, when we do sinful things, we need God's hand of chastisement to fall upon us so we can learn our lesson. So we don't continue doing those wicked things, right? But when God says, all right, you can go about, I'm going to stop punishing you. You can just go about, do whatever iniquity you want. That's a bad place to be with God. It means God has rejected you. All right? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 9. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 9 reads, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So it's saying here, the natural parent, you know, of course we do discipline our children so they can behave, 
but we do it for our own pleasure. Like, you know, we don't want our kids to mess up. We do it so we can have a peaceful household. So we'll discipline our kids, right? We want it, you know, we, want, we don't, you know, want a household of rebellion, things like that. God in the same way, but he makes sure when he disciplines us, it's for our profit. It's for us, you know, he does it for us. And then it says that we might be partakers of his holiness. Okay, so this is important. God wants us to be more holy. He wants us to be more righteous. He wants us to do the right things. So God will punish us when we sin against him. Look at verse number 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, after it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So God punishes us for our good. He does it so we profit. It's a good thing to be punished by God. It's a good thing to be chastised by God. It means he loves us. It means we're his children, okay? But when God says, you know what? I'm no longer going to punish you. Don't forget the people on this land. Many of them were unsaved, okay? So they were reprobate. God said, you know what? You can go about and continue your wicked ways which will allow you to get into, the, as, as, you know, into filthy things, perverted things. You want to treat God like that? Well, you want to reject God? Well, God's going to reject you, right? Back to Hosea chapter 4, verse number 15. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend. So God starts to turn his attention a little bit to Judah here. He says, look, Israel, you're a harlot. But he's kind of warning Judah. Judah, don't offend the same way that the northern kingdom is offending, right? And, you know, Judah at this point in time was more righteous, so they had weakness as well. They were more righteous. And God is basically telling them, look, look what Israel is doing, Judah. Don't be like that. Learn the lessons, all right? Learn how my judgment's fallen upon them, how the Assyrians are going to come and wipe them out. Learn from that so you don't make the same mistakes and turn against me. Unfortunately for Judah, eventually they did make the same mistakes and they turned against the Lord and they went into captivity by the Babylonians. All right? But here, God is warning Judah, let, uh, Yet let not Judah offend, and come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go ye up to Bethaven, nor swear the Lord liveth. So it says, look, don't go to these places. I assume it means that these places are where the people of Israel are committing wicked things especially worshipping false gods, all right? So God's saying, look, just don't go anywhere near there. Don't be influenced by, you know, the people of the northern kingdom. And you know what? This ought to be a warning for us. When we read God's word, and we see how God's people have become so distant from God. You know, this is an example for us. God does not want us to make the same mistakes. This is why he gives us so many warnings in the Bible. This is why God tells us these stories, so we can learn from them. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Israel had fallen. God did not want Judah to fall, but they did fall as well. You know what? God does not want us to fall. He wants us to learn the lessons from these people in the past, from these nations. Brethren, we don't need to learn it ourselves. You know, you and I, we're going to make mistakes. We're, we're going to sin. But listen, we don't need to get in such a wicked place with God. You know, just learn from the mistakes and see how God allowed His judgment to fall. You know, let's make sure that we learn from that, that we don't become those that fall as well. Look at verse number 16, Hosea 4, 16. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. That's a cow. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. So the backsliding heifer there is basically God saying that Israel, he's telling Judah, Israel is a re rebellious cow. It's a rebellious animal, okay? And now, so because they're rebellious, the Lord will feed them as a lamb. That's, that sounds good. The Lord will feed them as a lamb. But actually, this is not good, okay? It says, feed them as a lamb in a large place. So normally, yeah, a large place is wonderful if you have hundreds of thousands of sheep where you've got a shepherd that watches over them right and and of course you know when you have that sort of um group together the wolves the predators they're aren't more, they're less likely to attack the sheep when they're when they're together and and the shepherd is there well god's going to treat israel as a single lamb right it says a lamb i will feed them as a lamb a lamb one lamb in a large place 
So think about that. that the if, if a shepherd were to lead one single lamb to a very large place and leave it there, what's going to happen to that lamb? It's going to be destroyed. It's going to be eaten up. The predators are going to come and see that defenseless lamb on its own and it's gone. So God is telling Israel, look, you're, you're rebellious. You're backsliding against me. I'm just going to allow the wolves to come. I'm going to remove my hands of protection from you and you're going to be destroyed. And again, destruction came by the Assyrians. Verse number 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. So God, I, I believe... Either it's either to Hosea or again to Judah, the southern kingdom here. Hey, Ephraim, Ephraim was one of the tribes, but sometimes the northern kingdom was referred to as Ephraim as a whole. That happens many times in the Bible. And he says, look, because they've joined to idols, because they're worshipping false gods, let them alone. Leave, have nothing to do with them, is what God is saying. Judah, they are wicked. That nation has become wicked. Don't be like them. Don't even go and talk to them. Leave them alone. Have nothing to do with them because they're only going to influence you in a bad way. Verse number 18. Their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love. Give ye. God's saying, look, there's nothing good. Even their drinks are sour. Like, you, you think you're going to get some good drinks going to Israel? Listen, the, 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 there's nothing there that can profit, you know, the seven kingdom of Judah. They're committing whoredoms continually. They don't stop. And it says, her rulers... With shame do love, give ye. Now, I'll just explain that last bit to you because I had to read that over and over again a few times. So the rulers, that's of course those in authority, you know, um, the governing powers, maybe even the religious leaders of this day. It says they have shame, okay? Now, if you want them to love you, they will love, they, they will look kindly upon you, they will be merciful to you, but then they'll say to you, give ye. Now, when it comes to the King James Bible, we don't have quotation marks. You know, when someone speaks, we don't have those quotation marks that you'll find in your modern books, okay? So, what you'll find when you read your King James Bible, when someone speaks, in the middle of the sentence, the first letter will have a, uh, uh, it'll be a capital letter, okay? It'll be a capital letter. So, if you have a look at there, her rulers with shame do love, give, see the G, it's in capitals. So the rulers are saying, give ye. So what, what's happening here? The rulers are basically saying, hey, if you want us to look kindly upon you, if you want us to judge you know, in favor of you, you have to give us a bribe. <laughs> give ye, right? Give to us. If you give to us, if you give us money or gifts or whatever, hey, we'll let you do whatever you need to do, right? You want to start up a small business? Well, give ye, give us, and we'll make sure we allow you to do that. And so what God is saying, hey, what's, there's no point in going to Israel. There's no point in looking at the northern kingdom and making friends with them. You, you know, they, they demand a bribe. That, you know, they're, they're trying to rip you off, is what God is saying there, right? Verse number 19. The wind hath bound her up in her wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. And so it's saying here that Israel is going to blow away as a wind. Okay, there's no substance on that land anymore. Uh, they're just going to blow away in the wind. Of course, that wind, again, is the Assyrians. They're going to come and take them away. And they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifice. The reason why God is allowing the northern kingdom to be destroyed is because of their sacrifices to a false god. Okay? They've turned their backs against God. God says, well, they're just going to blow away with the wind. All right. So what's the lesson that we can conclude with uh, in this passage? Well, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And God is telling Judah, don't forget, he's telling Judah, have nothing to do with the northern kingdom. Hey, they're drunkards, they're committing whoredoms, they're liars, they're, they've got all these kinds of wickedness. And God's telling them, look, southern kingdom, stay away from them, have nothing to do with them. You know, don't mix with them because there's nothing good that's going to come from them. Well, the lesson that we can get out of this, brethren, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11, is of course for us, church discipline. You know, when someone commits a wicked act, you know, God commands that we discipline them, that we kick them out of the church, you know, to preserve the church, uh, to preserve the church, right? Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And here in 1 Corinthians 5, 11, it reads, But now have I written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater, 
or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. Brethren, if we have people in our church that are committing these kinds of wicked sins, it is right for us to put them away and say, you know what, you are no good to us, let them alone, have nothing to do with them, kick them out, right? And that's the lesson, right? Church discipline. Just like Judah were to not have no, was to have nothing to do with the Northern Kingdom, we should have nothing to do with those that have gotten kicked out of church, unless they repent, apologize, get things right with the church. Then that will be the only time that we would, of course, forgive them, receive them, and we can continue on serving the Lord together. So, brethren, I hope this is an interesting lesson for us. Hosea chapter four: God's warning us against sin. You know, God's warning us against drunkenness and. And warn us to, you know, not give ear to sinful things because it has an effect on our flesh. You know, when we focus on other people's sins, it's going to cause us, our flesh, to desire to do those same things, especially sins that are highly addictive. Okay, let's protect ourselves and make sure we don't fall. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, thank you for New Life Baptist Church. Lord, I can't wait to see the church next week. I pray that you'd open up... Uh, and Lord, make our way easy for myself and Isabel to get up there and to fellowship with the brethren there. Uh, Lord, I just pray that um, if there's any, any issues that need to be brought to my attention, Lord, that they will do so and, and help, Lord, that I can help them uh, make progress, Lord, and continue to serve you there on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, Lord, but most of all, I pray that you'd help us to take heed to your uh, warnings in this passage. Lord, help us to never become a people that uh, desire to have no knowledge, Lord, because we know that if we walk away from your knowledge, from your wisdom, that we're going to just simply destroy ourselves. Lord, our nation, Australia, is destroying ourselves. I pray that we would stand out, Lord. I pray that we would not be a people that just follow along in the ways of this world, but that we would stand out and be your people. And Lord, help, help us, Lord, to be like Hosea. Help us to be like the great people of God that stood up for you, even when their entire nation uh, had deserted you, had rebelled against you. So, Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.